resources, it is not possible to look at each of these indicators. But in case of Meghalaya, a relatively more detailed discussion has been attempted. National Family and Health Survey, NFHS 3 and 4, have been used to draw out more quantifiable measures of women's well-being, such as literacy, marriage, fertility, gender-based violence, nutritional status, etc. The MOSPI data, which is uh, the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementations uh, data, provides the index of basic rights for women by clubbing together the various indicators, and it also relies on the NFHS uh, data. It is particularly useful in drawing comparatives across uh, the states in the North, for example. At an international level, the Gender Inequality Index, or the GII, measures gender uh, inequalities in three important aspects of human development, reproductive health, empowerment, and economic Social, inter, uh, social Institutions and Gender ind Index is a cross-country measure of discrimination against women in social institutions built on dimensions of discriminations in the family, restricted physical integrity, uh, financial resources, taking into account the civil liberties of women. And uh, finally, the uh, Gender Social Norms Index measures how social beliefs obstruct gender equality in areas like politics, work, and education. It reveals new clues to the invisible barriers women face in achieving equality. Now we look at certain specific indicators on the status of women in India as a whole, as this would help us to build a context for Northeast. The percentage of literate women grew from 55 to 68% in 10 years. Economic empowerment indicators, such as the percentage of women independently using uh, a bank or a savings account also grew from 15 to 53 percent for the same time period. Specific state policies and interventions have also been introduced to promote gender equality. Beti Bachao, Beti Parhao, the Integrated Child Development Services, Janani Suraksha Yojana, Pradhan Mantri Ujjwala Yojana are some of the examples of these policy interventions. However, once we start to look away from these basic uh, progress indices to more enhanced ones, we find gaps, wide and stark gaps. So the two slides here, this one, first one, the, here they show us the performance, performance of India as per the international rankings and uh, states. So both uh, this GII, Gender Inequality Index, and the SIGI, CG rankings for India reflect some patterns. And I would uh, quote here, quotes begin, women make greater and faster progress where their individual empowerment or social power is lower. That is only the basic capabilities are there. But they face a glass ceiling where they have greater responsibility, political leadership and social payoffs in market, social life and politics, which are the enhanced uh, capabilities. Courts closed. The most stark example of this is found in the political representation of women. In the next few slides, we shall discuss this. In a country that takes pride in being the world's largest democracy, presence and performance of its women in countries' political spaces is perhaps the first tool one can adopt to ascertain the most quantifiable and tangible indicator of the status of the women in the society. The traditional societies of Northeast India are, are essentially patriarchal, and its women have generally not been able to have political power in local, state, or center politics. This is also due, at least in part, to some legal provisions. So customary laws are protected in Meghalaya under the sixth schedule, in Nagaland 371A, and Mizoram 371G, meaning that not all acts of Indian Parliament directly apply to these areas unless the state assemblies adopt them with a two-thirds majority. Now, uh, the 73rd and the 74th Amendment Acts of the Indian Parliament, that is the Panchayati Raj institutions, which guarantee reservations for women, therefore did not come into force directly in these states. Mizoram and Nagaland have adopted these provisions for urban municipal councils. However, except for Mizoram, it has not been actualized at an entry level for women in local politics. Meghalaya state legislature has not adopted these amendments. 
So uh, the representation of women in decision-making bodies in Northeast remains very marginal, beginning from the local level itself. Now let's look at the highest legislative body. So the 17th Lok Sabha saw the highest number of women parliamentarians. It's not very high, but out of uh, 78 women parliamentarians, only three women MPs represent the entire Northeast. Further, in these elections in Mizoram, for the first time ever, a woman candidate contested for the parliamentary seat, only one parliamentary seat of the state, but not on a party ticket, but as an independent candidate and lost. In Arunachal, a woman candidate contested on Janta Dal secular ticket and she lost. In Meghalaya, Agatha Sangma won for the third time from Thura. But let us recall that she's from a well-established political family. Second women parliamentarian from Northeast is from Guwahati, while third is from Tripura. So there are more details on this, which we can take up if there is a question about it. So according to Patricia Mukhim, she wrote in 2019 that in Meghalaya, women are active in politics of elections, both as voters and as political agents. Almost always, all political candidates have a group of women who work intensively for them during elections, doing door-to-door -door canvassing. This truly points to an anomaly between the political aspiration and political representation of women in the region. Women often show higher voter turnout than men. Chances of women winning as independent candidates are weak. The question is why political parties are unwilling to field the women candidates. The answer to this is connected to the larger debate of why so few women are given the party tickets and why the bill to introduce reservations for women in uh, the Lok Sabha are stalled year after year. Political representation of women also bears other high costs for them, for the women in the Northeast. Existing social taboos and stigmas associated with women who participate in political or public affairs are rampant. For example, amongst the Khasis, it is considered a sign of social degeneration. Similes such as when the hen crows, the world is nearing its end, or the winner in the family is a loser in the council, reflect these limitations adequately. The GSNI report says, and I quote, a social norm will be stickiest when individuals have the most to gain from complying with it and most to lose from challenging. Quotes close. It may be relatively easy to bring legislative interventions such as reservations first. However, the policies have to be informed of the non-tangible social norms and practices related to social change and gender inequality. For example, in 2017, highly patriarchal Nagaland was swept with mass protests and violence when women insisted on contesting for elections to the urban municipalities because they had been guaranteed these 33% reservations in the urban councils. So uh, let us now try to break the level and type of political participation for women in Northeast. When we look at the gender turnout, we see that for Meghalaya, women have equal or even higher voting rates than men. And it has been steadily increasing since uh, 1993 when it had a little downfall. But since 2003, the voter turnout of women has been higher than the men in state assembly elections. However, the parity at entry level political participation where the power is diffuse ends here. The women in Meghalaya are not politically empowered beyond this, as we see in the coming slides. In northeastern region, 70% of women say that they have interest in local elections. In Meghalaya, it is a very at a very high 86%, and in Mizoram, it's at 92%. So women's political membership to any political party is lowest in Meghalaya for the entire region at a 2%. Some, when we compare it to the average 16% of Northeast, and Sikkim is at high 60%. So if we see how many women have contested any political election, Meghalaya again has the lowest number, while Arunachal has the highest. In Meghalaya, when women were asked if they wished to contest political election, only one person gave a reply in affirmative, which is again the lowest for the entire Northeast, and Sikkim has the highest uh, figure in this. 
If we break down this political participation even further, we find that women in Northeast do not have many chances of even direct access to the elected representatives. This is also connected to various other factors, including the levels of autonomy for women in, within their communities, but also within their households. So we shall come to this factor of autonomy subsequently. Quickly moving on to the next slide. This slide helps one to find what Krishna has called opening up the community a bit further. Gaps in gender empowerment are also reflected at the level of local organizations and associations. In this chart, we find that nuances of membership of women to local non-political organizations, we find that Nagaland has the highest participation rate for women across the Northeast for women holding office positions. However, it is interesting to recall that this same very state went into mass protests and violence in 2017 against the women contestants for urban municipal council. So this is a strong indicator of how power is diffused at higher levels where actual decision-making power is beginning to take shape for women. We know from our previous slide that, this one, we know that, um, Women in Manipur are far less allowed to attend the village councils than their counterparts in Assam. So, political interest. Okay. Interestingly, if we, uh, interestingly, if we compare the states of Assam and Manipur, we find that the difference between numbers of women interested in local elections is not wide, nor is there much difference between their memberships to local parties. But the number of women allowed to attend local meetings is almost half for Manipur than Assam. Clearly, there are some other factors at work here. Similarly, in Meghalaya, despite relatively high interest in local elections, least number of women have either or any wish uh, to contest elections or have contested elections, uh, the local elections. I mean. Okay. Women in Meghalaya are voting much more fervently for state and parliamentary elections than their local bodies, and they stand apart from their counterparts in Northeast for this lukewarm response towards grassroots institutions. This is understandably related to the fact that Meghalaya does not have panchayat bodies and women are not allowed to participate or vote in the widely prevalent hierarchical customary institutions. Here I would like to talk a little bit about the changing nature of women's role in customary institutions in the East Khasi Hills. This lack of political represent representation and political ambition in Northeast is rooted in deep-seated patriarchal mindset. One finds the bias in traditional political bodies where women in general are marginalized under customary practices. So although women are the perpetrators of Khasi chieftainship, they have no active role whatsoever in traditional politics. Moreover, it is essential to see the nature of that participation to ascertain the limited role of women in actual decision-making process within these formal or customary political bodies. Women have to often work within the limits of duties that have been assigned to them by their male counterparts. And while participating in local darbars, they may be a little bit uh, within like uh, cities like Shillong as office holders or as treasurers or advisors. Besides this, uh, within these local councils, customary councils, darbars, there are women organizations such as Senkinthai at local levels. Uh, which act more as coordination bodies, you know, like uh, they are facilitating bodies and do not really enjoy any political power. In some urban doorbars, rarely the secretary and president of Sink and Thay are also ex gratia members of traditional doorbars. Indeed, the local customary institutions of Khasi polity remain very limited and uh, at the most, this figure was conveyed to me by the chairperson of the Meghalaya State Women's Commission that at the most only 25% and that too in urban centers, um, you know, the women's participation can be put to that. That is like the maximum. Some other studies have insisted that organizations like Senkinthai are neither traditional bodies nor is their membership or participation in these local darbars uh, an established practice. 
Apurba Barua says here, and I quote, in this sense, involvement of Singh in Thai in Durbar affairs is part of a reformist tendency under the influence of constitutional democratic politics. But the tradition of keeping women out of politics weighs heavily on these uh, local customary institutions. Quotes close. Now let us move on to some other aspects of women's status and position in Northeast. So in Northeast, uh, practices such as dowry and bride burning are not very prevalent. This may give rise to the presumption that violence against women is not a major concern in the area. Data collected by the Northeast Network, however, suggests that violence against women, particularly domestic violence, is on the rise. The ongoing armed conflict situation prevalent in Northeast has intensified the violence faced by women, which takes the form of sexual, mental, or physical abuse, killings, and clashes. Although all the members of communities are affected by the armed conflict, the impact on women and girls is far greater because of their status in society and their sex. The region under the shadow of conflict has witnessed a resurgence of patriarchal values and norms, which have brought with them new restrictions on the movement of women, the dress they wear, and uh, more overtly physical violence such as rape, which is systematically used as a tactic against a particular community. In the next few slides, we will discuss some more data on various indexes which are applicable to women in Northeast. This slide here brings a comparative perspective for the status of women in Northeast. It has condensed various factors based on the data from 2004 uh, from NFHS as well as from MOSPI, and uh, it is under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Overall, the index of freedom from violence shows that compared to India, average of 0.8 trim, Sikkim has the highest index in Northeast at 0.96, while Meghalaya is lowest at 0.9. 31% of women in Meghalaya say that they have been physically mistreated or beaten, beaten, which is in fact higher than the India average of 21% and also highest in the Northeast. This is a strong number in the light of the fact that Meghalaya has a matrilineal tribes in majority. However, it is possible that large number of cases of domestic violence are reported or registered here than in the other patriarchal sectors. Against the national average of 52%, women express autonomy in decision makings regarding their own health care. 79% in Meghalaya make independent decisions about their health care. This figure is highest in the category for entire Northeast. The index of, uh, index of access to economic resources, Meghalaya and Nagaland stand out. A total calculated index of autonomy against the India average of 0.39 presents a very divisive picture for Northeast. States like Meghalaya and Arunachal are higher, and Assam and Tribura are lower than it. On women's gender gaps in work and remuneration, Meghalaya of all the states is indexed with a higher gender-based wage inequality. The nutrition and health indicators show that against the 2004 national average of 0.47, Assam lies at a low 0.42 and Mizoram at 0.35. Index of realized sexual and reproductive rights for women in Northeast, we find that women here enjoy less rights than the Indian average from 2004. So having looked at some quantifiable statistics that shed light on the performance of women, uh, we now look at some indicators that help us to draw insights from inside the households and shed light on what is happening inside the families in the region. In this slide, we look at data from 2016 on other social indicators like the position of women in family decision making. Across Northeast, Meghalaya has the highest percentage of women in the role of followers of family decisions. Sikkim and Tripura are at high rates in their perceived role as decision makers in family decisions. And almost 60% uh, of women in this uh, region see themselves as followers of family decision making process. Again, some more nuances of this independence mentioned in this previous slide, we find here that 0.6% of women from Meghalaya and Assam feel themselves to be independent in marriage. Dr. Kavita, if you can hear me, you have five yes, more sir. minutes to conclude your presentation, please. Okay, sir. I would take a little bit more than five, but I can skip through these uh, so I can... No, maybe, I maybe would, would... instead of five, it could be six, but uh, try to conclude in that. Okay, I'll try. Thank you so much. So uh, independence in decision making in uh, property matters uh, is what is really closely related to my uh, project. 
uh, this helps us to demystify the gender empowerment myth in northeast especially amongst the matrilineal people of meghalaya although women are custodians and owners of ancestral lands and property they are not independent in deciding on matters related to property and i have talked more about this in my previous presentation at nmml which is available on you so uh, very quickly i'm going to run through uh, some very specific indicators for meghalaya so uh, according to the 2011 census the indian average sex ratio stands at 943 while meghalaya with a very high 997 which has still uh, been the same at 2020 but it's a negative indicator nonetheless a more detailed look into the sex ratio differences within the state shows important roles played by factors other than matrilineal the rural urban divide the differences in other uh, significant socio economic indicators point towards what can be some of the reasons behind these intra regional variations for example reboy district of meghalaya has the lowest sex ratio in the entire state of meghalaya and the urban sex ratio here has seen a sharp decline however the urban sector uh, in reboy has seen the increase in the density of population by a hopping to 62 points so there are like these intra regional variations which have their own context their own reasons which i think the policy needs to be aware of whenever we are trying to support the cause of gender equality and gender empowerment similarly we see that nfhs data establish growing tendencies towards the gaps between rural and urban populations in meghalaya and gaps between the literacy rates between the urban and the rural women so uh, women also do not experience independence and autonomy in other important matters of their li uh, life as we saw in the previous slides like they're not free to uh, decide on matters relating to their marriage for instance it is necessary and i quote here from uh, human development report of meghalaya from 2008 it is uh, to noteworthy to observe that women are not able to penetrate or carve a place in the traditional political setup of hima doloishup or nokmash as we find that depending on the indicators used it is important that nuances of autonomy and gender empowerment are explored to ascertain the right of women in meghalaya because they can be often camouflaged under uh, you know um, the community practices uh, and uh, the women are most vulnerable to get marginalized if any challenge comes from that and finally we once we start to look at the more enhanced indices of progress and empowerment for women wide and stark gaps are visible in the status of women GSNI talks about these gender based biases and shows that uh, in a phase of 10 years a number of people with biases has been growing in india it shows a trend that is affecting women more than the men of india it would be thus interesting to find out what makes women grow more biased against women over these last 10 years that part is that these biases are getting stronger despite the policy measures and legislative efforts towards gender equality we have seen these trends in women's political participation and representation the situation at last i would like to say that situation is in tandem with numbers across the world and i quote this undp report from 2020 when more concentrated political power is at stake women appear severely underrepresented the higher the power and responsibility wider the gender gap and for heads of state and government it's almost 90% so then uh, as economic power also increases from employee to employer and from employer to top entertainer or billionaire the gender gap widens code flow perhaps the most striking fact that emerges from this data is that the share of men and women who had no gender bias against women fell from 2005 to 2020 in this sense gender norms have become wider and harder in these last 10 years This shows how gender inequality translates into other areas of human development and threatens the progress. Since India is a signatory to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, and this year 2020 marks the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration to which India is a signatory, it is crucial that investing into women's equality and lifting both their living standards and their empowerment are central to the national goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kavita. We are now open to questions and comments from all the participants.
Yes, please go ahead. Dr. Janki, please Thank go you. ahead. Thank you, Kavita, for your presentation. I was wondering if you could tell us um, a little more about this data that you've presented on um, women's independence in decision making in in property matters. And your 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 slides seem to show that actually they had very little independence. I was wondering where this data is from and how women's independence in is being gleaned in these figures. Uh, you know, because yeah. as we all know, in, in matters related to property, there are many issues. Are women free to, to uh, sell the property or um, are they free to do home improvement or what are the kinds of decisions that we're uh, talking about? That was one. And two is um, some of your slides, you're using uh, in one of the slides before that, you, they, you were using NCW data. And I was yeah. wondering, yeah, and I was wondering what is the source of their data? Meaning are they presenting, um, uh, you know, when they present their statistics, uh, what is the source of their data? Because I doubt if they are collecting uh, this data. Yeah. Thank you, Janki. Mm. So, um, should I answer this or you want to collect some more questions? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, you answer it. Okay. So, uh, let me start from the second question. Uh, the data is there from their own field work and oh. uh, they seem to have done extensive, um, um, but of course, these are control samples. So, we cannot compare it to NFHS uh, level data. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so um, well, your first question was more about property matters and that brings me back to my core of my study uh, really like I can talk about the uh, East Kasi Hills more in details about this so we know uh, that uh, women are uh, you know not owners in that sense they are custodians and uh, they are there is an intersectionality at work here. So you cannot really say that only men are taking decisions. It's the family which is deciding. But within the family, of course, uh, it's the uncles, you know, the maternal uncle, the eldest uncle, or the eldest siblings would definitely have a more decisive voice in deciding because it is, after all, the youngest daughter, the Khaddo, amongst uh, the Khasi who inherits. So, um, uh, and from uh, through my own field work, probably you would recall I talked about uh, incidents from urban uh, center uh, that uh, a woman, uh, after all, decided to sell her ancestral property because legally it's in her name, right? So there is this clash between the legal technicalities and customary practices. But uh, it was perceived to be a wrong decision by her close family her friends in the larger circles and they said like she really has given up on family in this sense and if she is in trouble nobody is going to you know stand by her or help her out um at the same time uh, i have also heard of instances uh, through my field work where uh women did not in you know, despite being a kadu and despite the family being uh, landed because the mother decided to sell the property and invest into the daughter's education for instance to make her more capable so i uh, to you know to get a job for herself and you know uh, so i see that the, the things are moving and that's why i look at the changing nature of land rights that how um there is a there is a modern state parameter there is modern economy there are development factors which are at work maybe uh, a woman mm -hmm. does not want to inherit <clears throat> out of choice because it restricts her social mobility she has to stay in the place to uh, you know uh, to um, to get those rights so if she's away she needs to have a family which is looking after it. But if she marries a non-tribal, and then she could lose her right. And that's like a really hotly contested debate. So it is not as simple as that. And I'm sure it's not as uh, simple in all other states as well. But of course, to answer your query, I can tell more from East Khasi Hills rather than give a more general idea about what's happening in other Northeast states. I mean, one most important factor is that where is the land? Because um, a high number of landless families, especially in rural Meghalaya, 
point to the fact that there are social inequalities you know within these tribal communities uh, which are really not neither been um, considered through policy initiatives nor being debated within uh, the communities uh, there is privatization of lands so so not all women are equal they have their own uh, you know caste and urban rural literacy so all the factors are there which affect their rights in that way how much they want to assert those rights if they have those rights so suppose a woman is highly literate and she's really highly positioned so i guess her weightage of her decision on property matters within the family would be higher compared uh, to any other woman so i guess there are various nuances to it so you are right janaki but uh, i hope i've been able to answer it somewhat because uh, that's not really the focus uh, of this presentation today thank you very I'm much any other question all right i think with this we come uh, to an end of uh, today's lecture on this subject i thank uh, kavita and i thank uh, all other participants who have joined us this afternoon okay. thank you sir Bye. thank you everybody for joining in Okay bye bye